Tone production. When we produce a note on the saxophone, air travels from our lungs. We need a good air support to produce a good sound. So diaphragmatic or breathing exercises are a good starting point for developing a good sound. We should aim to produce a steady air stream, so practicing long tone exercises daily is something that all saxophone players are encouraged to do. The air moves into the vocal tract, which contains the larynx. The larynx contains the vocal cords and is where we make sounds. The larynx moves up and down automatically when we do things like yawning, swallowing, speaking or singing, etc. But we can consciously move it up and down, which will have an effect on the pitch and tonal quality of the notes we create. Singers often move the larynx into a position to produce a better, higher sounding note. The saxophone player will also need to learn how to use the larynx in connection with other factors to produce a good sound. The air moves into the mouth, which we call the oral cavity. By moving our tongues, we can change the volume or space within our mouths, and as a result, change the pitch and tonal quality of the notes. Every person's oral cavity is different, and that is why we all sound differently. We also move our tongues into different positions to compensate for the different equipment and mouthpiece setups we have. If we divide our tongues into three parts, the back, center, and front, then by moving the various parts up and down and by moving the tongue forward and backwards into certain positions, we will not only affect the tonal quality and pitch of the notes, but will also make it easier for certain notes to resonate. The problem is that it's difficult for teachers to explain where is the ideal place to position the parts of the tongue to produce a good sounding note, since it's different for everyone, since we all have different anatomy and we all play a different setup. However, some generalizations can be made with the understanding that this is just a starting point and that the student would have to experiment to find the best position for their tongues. Using sound and vowel shapes can be helpful since when we pronounce certain sounds and vowels, the tongue moves into a similar but not the exact position to produce a good sound. Using the IPA chart for pronunciation, teachers can point to certain sound formations for tongue positions for the different ranges of the saxophone. The only minor problem here is that not all sounds on the IPA chart are pronounced the same in all over the world. You may find that putting the tongue in the position or back positioning vowels will help with the low notes, center positioning vowels with the mid range and front positioning vowels for the high notes. This is just a guide and experimentation is needed as it's not perfect. For example, you may find that out of all of these sound shapes, the shape for you, as in you, ooh, is good for getting out and improving on the quality of the low notes. The shape for E, as in chaos, eh, is good for the mid range. And the shape for I, as in biz, eh, is good for the high notes. Generalizations of sound shapes cannot be made for the altissimo notes. But here, the height of the back of the tongue increases as the tongue moves forward then the tongue lowers as higher and higher autismal notes are played. The air then travels across the reed, causing it to vibrate and produce the sound. This sound is also affected by the lower jaw and lips. By tightening the lips, the pitch of the note will rise, and by loosening the lips, the pitch will lower. This also happens by raising and lowering the lower jaw. However, the lower jaw can also move forward and backwards, which will change the position of the lower teeth and lower lip on the reed which will also change the tonal quality of the note. This will also happen by moving the mouthpiece in and out slightly between the lips. The mouthpiece has a flat part called a table and a curved part called a facing. When the reed is placed on the mouthpiece, there is a point where the reed moves away from the mouthpiece. This is the ideal place to position the lower teeth and lower lip to give the maximum space for the reed to vibrate. However, for larger mouthpieces, it may be more practical not to put your lower teeth and lower lip hair, as there might be too much mouthpiece in your mouth, making it a little harder to play. Usually we want the reed to vibrate freely in order to produce the necessary frequencies to create a rich, full tone. However, at other times, we want to reduce these higher frequencies to create a more dampened or quieter sound, such as when playing subtones. When we play a note in a saxophone like the low B, the fundamental will sound, which is the frequency of the note that we are aiming for. But in addition to this, a lot of other frequencies will also sound, as you can see from the other spikes in this screenshot taken from a spectrum analyzer.
These frequencies, which sound along with the frequency of the note that we are aiming for, are called harmonics, partials or overtones, and are needed to give the tonal quality, richness and timbre of the saxophone. By changing the position of the lower lip to cover more or less of the reed, we can allow more harmonics to sound to give a brighter, fuller sound, or dampen them to create a more mellow or dark sound, or to create subtones or quieter sounds. So the position of our lips and lower jaw are important for creating a good tone in conjunction with the position of our tongue and the position of the larynx. The air then travels into the mouthpiece, which is affected by the type of mouthpiece due to the various characteristics of the mouthpiece, which we will discuss later. The air continues into the saxophone and is affected by the saxophone and eventually by the music that we listen to, which will affect how we perceive the notes played and influence how the notes should sound. Lip position and pressure. Since the position of the lips and lower jaw will affect the quality of the sound, there is what is called a classical embouchure and a jazz embouchure. The classical embouchure is formed in such a way to create the sounds associated with classical playing, and the jazz embouchure is created to produce the more free sounding notes with lots of overtones. There is also what is called a single lip embouchure and a double lip embouchure. Saxophone players will use what is best for the type of music they are playing. To form a single lip embouchure, the player will place the upper teeth on top of the mouthpiece and the lower teeth at the point where the reed moves away from the mouthpiece. This position is ideal for alto and soprano saxophones but may differ for tenor and barry or due to the type of sound the player is trying to achieve. The lower lip overlaps the lower teeth slightly. The height of the lip and the amount of lip overlapping the lower teeth varies depending on whether you want a classical or jazz sound. As a starting point, pronounce the letter V as in victory. And the position of the tip of the lower teeth on the lower lip can be used as a guide when overlapping the lower teeth. But as was said before, the position of the lower teeth and lower lip varies as does the thickness of the lip above the lower teeth. For jazz playing, the lower lip will be curled out to some degree, so there'll be less lip inside the mouth and less dampened frequencies. The corners of the lips are squeezed in. Some will pull the corners of the lips straight in, while others will pull them in and up, forming a kind of smile or smirk. The less common form of embouchure is the double lip embouchure used by Coltrane. Here, the upper lip also overlaps the upper teeth, hence the term double lip embouchure. Some saxophone players prefer not to overlap the lower teeth with the lower lip, which means that the reed is only supported by the lower lip. With this type of embouchure, you will not be able to tighten your lips with the same force as other embouchures, since the lower jaw is not involved. But it has the added advantage that it will be impossible to bite, which is a common problem with beginners. Once the embouchure that is chosen is formed, then the lower lip will cover a certain amount of the reed. If the area covered by the lower lip moves towards the tip of the reed, then less of the reed is exposed in the mouth and the reed is dampened, and so there will be less higher frequencies. So to create a subtone, the lower lip is moved near to the tip of the reed. This can be done in two ways. Either move the lower jaw inwards to create an overbite, or by rolling the saxophone out of the mouth. With the latter, this would mean that the upper and lower teeth alignment is not changed, but merely the position of the mouthpiece has changed. Creating an overbite is more common as the top teeth stay in the same position. So to sum up, to create a good tone, you will need to move your larynx into the right position, move your tongue to create the right shape, have your lips and lower jaw in the right position, and have the right amount of pressure applied by your lips, and this will all change from note to note. Mouthpiece pitch. As was stated, there are lots of things going on at the same time to produce a good tone, and different saxophone players will do all these things differently to produce the same outcome. There are two trains of thought when it comes to teaching students. One is to teach the student to use the embouchure to play a particular pitch for the particular type of saxophone on the mouthpiece only, known as the mouthpiece pitch. It is believed that if the student keeps the embouchure the same when playing the mouthpiece pitch and continues to do that when connected to the whole saxophone, then all of the notes will sound their best throughout the ranges. The mouthpiece pitches are C for soprano, A for alto, F sharp or G for tenor, and D for barry. The other train of thought is that the student should learn to play a scale on the mouthpiece alone. This is because it's argued that each note on the saxophone may have a different mouthpiece pitch to sound at its best. However, for the beginner, it is easier to learn to play the particular mouthpiece pitch 
than to learn a scale which would take a longer time to play the intervals. Professionals will follow either viewpoint, with some for the most part keeping the embouchure the same throughout the range, while others changing it depending on what note is played. If you look at professional players, some will have their jaw and lips virtually still while playing, while others will move their lower jaw up and down, backwards and forwards, in order to make the notes played sound at their best. Wedge test. One of the main problems with beginners is knowing how much pressure should be applied to the reed. Often beginners tend to bite down on their mouthpieces, causing the notes to play sharp and the lower lip to hurt. As a starting point, in order to know how much pressure to apply with the lips, you can do what is called the wedge test. Basically, you produce the mouthpiece pitch on the mouthpiece alone, and without stopping, you pull the mouthpiece out of your mouth and return it without changing your embouchure. This may be difficult to do at first, but if the lip pressure is correct, then you would hear the note, then you would hear your breath when the mouthpiece is taken out, then you'd hear the note again as the mouthpiece is replaced. If the lip pressure is too much, then as you take the mouthpiece out, you will hear a buzz sound as your lips close together. Remember, there should be just enough pressure to sound a note. Another thing you could try is to increase and release the pressure to find the point when a note begins to sound. Overtone and undertone matching. There are various exercises that you can do to help control your sound, such as overtone and undertone matching. For overtone matching, you play the note with the octave key, and then you play the same note without the octave key, but you try to make them sound the same. With undertone matching, you do the reverse. You play the low note, and then you play the same note with the octave key, but you try to make both the notes sound the same. You should be able to do this by changing the position of your tongue. Now let's turn our attention to equipment. Equipment. The quality of the sound mainly comes from the player, and that's why a professional will sound equally good on different equipment, because he knows how to compensate for the different quality of the equipment. After the ability of the player, the mouthpiece is the next thing that would affect the sound the most. Mouthpieces are usually made of ebonite, hard rubber, or metal, but may be made of any material that is strong enough, such as plastic, wood, or even glass. There are many different characteristics to look for when buying a mouthpiece, as all these characteristics working together will affect the sound and articulation of the notes played. First, there is the ball which connects the mouthpiece to the neck. This leads into the chamber, which can be small, medium, or large. Usually a small chamber gives a brighter, more piercing sound, but this has to be viewed in conjunction with the baffle. The chamber is designed in different shapes, such as round, horseshoe, square, etc. It is argued that the shape has an effect on the sound. The baffle is on the inside of the mouthpiece under the beak. It can be high, low, stepped, or some other contour. It can also have ridges in it. It is the baffle that most affects the sound, and the person would have to play the combination of baffle and chamber size to find which will produce the best sound that they are looking for. It might be easier to find out what an artist is using that you want to sound like and purchase something with similar characteristics that you can play well. Another characteristic of the mouthpiece is the facing, which can be short, medium or long. Most mouthpieces will be made with just one size facing, but it is believed that the facing can help with the articulation. The last characteristic is the tip opening. This is the gap size between the tip of the reed and the tip of the mouthpiece. Large tip openings allow the reed to vibrate a greater distance, creating a greater sound since the gap is bigger and more air can be forced through it. It is also better for producing various dynamics such as bends, etc. However, it may be harder to control. Smaller tip openings are easier to play, but there is the danger that you might stop the reed from vibrating when using a lot of air. Usually small tip openings are used in classical playing, while large tip openings are used more in jazz. Whichever mouthpiece is chosen, the correct reed must also be added. Softer reeds are usually used with large tip openings and harder reeds with small tip openings. Choosing the correct mouthpiece is difficult, especially since they can be very expensive. Also, if you watch mouthpiece comparison videos and read the comments, you may come to the conclusion that many mouthpieces sound exactly alike, especially if they have the same characteristics, and yet others sound totally different, such as metal versus ebonite. The only way you can truly know whether a mouthpiece is right for you is to try it out. Metal mouthpieces are considerably smaller inside the mouth than ebonite mouthpieces. The next thing to consider is the reed. Reeds are made either from cane, some form of synthetic substance or a combination of both. And the contour and strength of the reeds vary. Some reeds are shaped especially for classical playing 
while others are shaped more for jazz and may be indicated in the name of the reed. Reeds come in different strengths, which are not standard. So a two according to one manufacturer may be slightly different from a two from a different manufacturer. So if you are changing brands, a reed chart should be consulted, especially if you're changing from cane to synthetic. The design and cut of the reed is different whether you are using a synthetic or cane reed. With cane reeds, the tip thickness may be different. The position of the heart may be higher or lower down on the reed or may be longer or shorter. The reed may be filed with more of the reed shaved towards the hilt. Also, the contour of the reeds can be shaved differently. This all results in a reed that feels different and plays differently. Cane reeds are made from a natural product and so the quality of the reed varies within a box of reeds. You will find that some reeds play better and sound better than others within the same box. Some saxophone players also believe that the quality of the sound is dependent on how the reed is broken in. So some musicians will take many days to break in their reeds. The humidity in the air also affects how the reed will play. So having a correct, good sounding reed will make a huge difference to your sound. If you have a bad reed, no matter how you change the other factors, your sound will not be good. Choosing a reed can be difficult and the only way to know whether the reed is right for you is to play them. Some reeds may help with playing the low notes while others will help to play in the altissimo range. Ligature. The ligature is there to connect the reed to the mouthpiece. Ligatures are made of various materials. A normal metal ligature will hold the reed rigidly to the mouthpiece, whereas other ligatures made from more flexible materials will have a dampening effect on the reed. Some ligatures have plates which will hold the reed to the mouthpiece using different contact points, while others are built into the mouthpiece. Nevertheless, having said all of that, and in spite of how expensive they can be, the ligature is the part of the mouthpiece setup that affects the sound the least, and in most situations, the hearer will not be able to hear the difference in sound. It is better to buy a better mouthpiece or practice on moving your throat, tongue, and lips than to buy a more expensive ligature. When looking to buy a ligature, it may be better to look for one that secures the reed firmly, that fits all of your mouthpieces, that is easy to use, such as having one screw and looks good. Mouthpiece setup. The correct placement of the reed on the mouthpiece is important for a good sound. First make sure that if using a cane reed it is sufficiently wet. Use a glass of water or your saliva. Reed storage cases that keep the reed wet may help. You can even put the reed on first and then the ligature but there is the danger of damaging the tip of the reed by hitting it with the ligature as you put the ligature over the reed. Or you can put the ligature on first and then slide the reed under the ligature. The tip of the reed should never be above the tip of the mouthpiece, but rather in line with the tip of the mouthpiece or just below. If just below, you can judge it by looking for a small outline of the mouthpiece above the reed. This can be made easier by pushing down a reed with your thumb until the tip of the reed makes contact with the tip of the mouthpiece. Where you place the ligature will also affect the sound. The mouthpiece may have a ligature line, so place the ligature behind that line. By placing the ligature further back, you may create a buzzy sound. By placing the ligature forward forward, you may increase the resistance of the reed. Again, experimentation is the key. Saxophone. As we said before, the sound mainly comes from the player, but having a good saxophone will also make a difference. Some saxophones are more in tune than others, so the player will have to make fewer adjustments. Some saxophones have keys in better positions for the hand, which will make it easier to play. Some saxophones have smaller pad to tone hole distances, which will make playing quicker. The weight of the saxophone is different and the quality of the materials used are different. Some saxophones are free blowing while others have a resistance to them. It's all about finding the saxophone that feels and plays best for you. Most players can hear and feel the difference between the saxophones but the audience may not be able to hear the difference. Saxophones can be unlacquered or lacquered with different colored materials. The difference in sound between an unlacquered and lacquered saxophone is slight, with the difference between lacquered ones being impossible to tell them apart. It is probably better when considering the lack of the saxophone to view it as to how it makes the saxophone look rather than to the quality of the sound that the lacquer affects. It is easy to fall into the trap of seeking to get better and better gear assuming that it will make your playing better, especially due to the outlandish claims of the manufacturers. However, in reality, even though better gear will have an effect, 
it would only shine when the player is able to use them based upon their skill. So it is better to work on your skill first rather than hunting down new gear. Thank you.